more and what congregational affiliation, what community, that would be great. Um, the other thing I would ask is if you can change, rename your names to say your name and your congregation or affiliation, that'd also be a great way for us to get to know each other. So it's great to have you with us. I can go first. Hi, Greg. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Craig. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Craig. Hi, Craig. Hi. Good to Hi. see you. I, I'm um, Craig McCall, retired priest uh, attending St. John's Cathedral. Wonderful. Now, we're going to just highlight some opportunities for this fall. And as you, uh, as you drop in, just by at any time, uh, let us know who you are as we go along. This fall, we have started to gather and prepare some offerings always that complement what are happening in parishes and that don't duplicate what's happening there. Uh, but we also want to let you know that as a faith formation team, Tracy, Elizabeth, and I are very much available to you for consultation. We're visiting you uh, for both virtual visits and, and conversations, um, uh, especially during this time of COVID. But this fall, we put together several things we think might be of particular interest to you. Just to remind you that Discover, Embrace, Become is our online uh, catechumenate, you might call our welcoming and seeker experience. And so we have an online course that uh, is available to you. It's ready to roll. It's a great small group offering for people who are beginning a faith journey, either for the very first time, or if something big has happened in their life and they need to start again, it's a great offering. And I think I said to the team a few weeks ago, I think something big has happened to all of us. And so it seems like Discover may be more timely than ever as a way to seek and experience God and each other in new ways in light of this season of COVID. EFM or Education for Ministry is kind of at the other end of the spectrum for people who are much further along in the journey perhaps and are really ready to unpack scripture, learn skills of theological reflection, and that's being offered also as a hybrid offering. Uh, we are partnering with BTS uh, this fall to offer an online cohort of leaders. This could be clergy, lay leaders, formation leaders, uh, teachers, uh, to have a place to build their skills, and I would say build, build our skills beyond just having a Zoom meeting for creative and meaningful ways to gather people during Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. And then our fall quest is going to be a virtual quest this fall, and it's, we've uh, pushed it back a month to, uh, to better fit the needs of young people this fall with uh, online learning happening right now, and that'll be Saturday, November 14th. We had a great experience this summer uh, in connection with our office and the race task force for the church in Colorado with Catherine Meeks in training um, a wonderful three session uh, intensive, I guess you'd call it, on becoming beloved community, how to be more attentive and open and engaged in race justice and building equality and care for all of God's beloved community. And that's gonna be available as an online offering for you uh, this fall as well. Right now we're working on creating a new opportunity called Journey to Bethlehem. It's gonna be a shared, I guess you'd say cross, uh, cross congregational experience uh, along the lines of our hybrid Camino that we had this summer that you'll hear more about today, where people can join in a very intentional spiritual walk uh, through the seasons of Christmas, uh, Advent, celebrating Christmas and then uh, looking at Epiphany forward into the year ahead. And then coming in January, we will uh, have our next uh, intensive in the reality area of LGBTQIA welcoming and inclusion with the Reverend Canon Susan Russell of Los Angeles. So that's something to look forward to. So if you have questions about any of these, reach out to any of the three of us. You'll start to see these regularly, already many of them right now in the digest uh, in the Episcopalian. Uh, but if you have questions between then and now and then, by all means, reach out to any of us for those. We wanted to talk a little bit about um, hybrid experiences today. And we're going to use some technical language and maybe 
hybrid lingo. And we're doing that both to, so that we have a shared common language and so that you start to imagine if you haven't already thought about some of these ways to make it uh, a really rich experience. I don't know about you, but if someone tells me that it's time to have one more Zoom call, I'm not so excited. Uh, and so we're not talking about just adding Zooms. Uh, I think we all have enough of those uh, to fill our plate. And, um, but I'd say there's many ways to gather. The idea of hybrid is that it's combining more than one modality of teaching or engaging or gathering. And so we're gonna think about things in terms of uh, how we gather people in various ways to accomplish a goal. And so we always are mindful when we do that of remembering our intention. And at, at its core, all of our gatherings and formation are really about helping people to delve and to have deeper experiences of God, right? And so we try to employ the right tools and the right ways of gathering that will help support that in a given way, in a given opportunity. So the different modalities could be Zoom, which is a great way to have group interaction. Canvas is an online learning platform that we partner with ILIF School of Theology here in Denver. And Canvas uh, is a great place to offer more content. So if you want to have a course, for example, that you have students in a course and they're interacting with the material and with each other, uh, it's wonderful for that. It's different than Zoom. Zoom is uh, something where we're all together at the same time. Canvas is when someone wants it to be on their time. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then another important thing we've discovered in the last six months is it's important to have common, meaningful, individual activities that people take part in. Uh, and then they do it away from screens. So Liv, if we, you and I were doing the week's activity, we wouldn't do it in the same moment or online at the same moment. But you and I would do the same activity. And then when we came together at the end of the week, we could share it from that experience. Our experience of that has been that as we do that asynchronously, and I'll say that in a moment, it, we really share the experience even though we're not actually doing it together. So it's a really powerful kind of thing. Synchronous and asynchronous, I wanted to highlight these words because we kind of throw them around. Synchronous means we're live at the same time, like we are right now in this session. Uh, and so there's some real purposefulness in having synchronous opportunities, things that happen together. But there's a huge potential in asynchronous possibilities activities, explorations, they could be prayer experiences, all kinds of things that people do on their own. And then that becomes the fuel, the material from which people can share when they do come together synchronously. So it's a good thing in a hybrid offering to balance online and away from screen offerings. In fact, we're gonna talk about the hybrid Camino today and the hybrid Camino was really interesting because we only had an hour of live synchronous time a week as a weekly check-in but there was a lot of things going on away from the screens. And of course, walking a Camino, even a hybrid Camino, is about walking and you can't do that in front of a screen. Um, but at its core, all these things we encourage you as you think about these offerings, to think about these main ideas, to seek, create opportunities to help seek meaning and connection, uh, not as a substitute for our physical in-person gatherings and encounters that we might wish for, that we used to have. But to think of this as not unreal, but real gathering that's helping people to deepen their faith. There's nothing unreal about virtual or hybrid experiences. And I know from the offerings we've been sharing this summer and I guess the last six months, we have found how moving and how deepening they can be. There we go. Uh, Greg mentioned the hybrid Camino that we um, offered this summer. And it came after a series of um, hybrid experiences that we'd offered throughout the spring. Um, and as summer approached, we really started thinking of how we could offer an experience that was faith deepening, um, inspiring, help people process uh, what they were experiencing during this time of COVID. Um, and would bring joy to people in a time that seemed a little bit empty of joy. And so we hatched this idea of the, the hybrid Camino, uh, where people walked the final stretch of the Camino um, to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. So people actually walked 
the final 75 miles on their own time. Um, but we created an online community where people interacted in multiple ways throughout a course of preparation that lasted six weeks and then three weeks of actual walking time. Um, and afterwards we got together and huddled and said, you know, what, what made this work? Because it was um, a really meaningful and amazing experience for, for the participants and we had some really excellent feedback. And the things that we think made it work um, were that it allowed participation from wherever people were. So we had primarily people walking in Colorado, but we also had people walking on both coasts, one person walking in Spain. Um, some people walked with family members who were across the country. Um, another thing that was really successful is that we had a pretty large shared leadership team. Um, and so the onus of the preparation and uh, the different activities that we offered throughout the Camino weren't just one person's efforts. Um, we really came together as a team and said, this person could do this and this person could do this. And if the one person wasn't available one week, um, there was only somebody to step in. Um, we took advantage of both large group sessions where we could um, teach, have teaching moments, um, but also small groups. So we took advantage of the breakout feature in Zoom to break people weekly into small groups that they stayed with for the whole Camino. Um, and these groups were intimate and loving uh, communities for people uh, online. Um, as Greg mentioned, asynchronous and in-person um, is an important aspect of hybrid. So people do some things on their own time, some, some things live like we're doing right now. Um, and what we've learned with the online components, and I joke sometimes with Greg and I call this just in time formation, but you can tweak things up to the last moment with online. So throughout the Camino, we were constantly adjusting things or adding new things as we realized what people were needing. Um, and so it allowed us to be really responsive. Um, we offered this in a way that there were multiple options that people were invited to participate in, but they didn't have to. So each person's Camino pilgrimage was really a unique experience to that person. Um, all along the way, um, we had a lot of activities, but we always had an opportunity to reflect either in person or via a discussion online. We also um, wanted to provide a sense of accountability so people were inspired to continue through the course and mark their progress. And we did that with a sort of passport um, that we mailed to people in advance. Um, and then we also incorporated things like prayer beads and a, a Camino shell and other symbols of the uh, Camino that just allowed people for prayerful moments, a feeling of connection because we all had these uh, items together. Um, and then along the way, we also had regular intervals uh, where we would stop and have a celebration um, and mark the journey that way as well. And then Elizabeth is gonna speak a little bit about onboarding people before we move on. Yes, so one of the reasons why we thought that this worked so well is that we really took a good portion of time to onboard people. So our first meeting, we went through everything that could possibly go wrong technology-wise, even if people have been using hybrid learning for a while, or they've been using Zoom or things like that for a while, you just never know what is going to slip through the cracks and what people are going to have a difficult time with. For example, something I just learned recently, and I've been using Zoom forever, if you see the two little lines that divide your, your pictures of everyone and the shared screen, you can make that smaller or bigger so you can see more people. I didn't know that until a couple of weeks ago, and it's super helpful. Um, so really, it's just going through things like that, these little tips that could catch people up, that if you take those, those moments before at the very beginning to really just explain those, onboard those, it's going to make the experience that much fuller and that going to give people the ability to go that much deeper. And really helping people to understand if you have questions or you don't know how to do something, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help you really just making the experience as smooth as possible technology-wise 
that way you are able to go deeper uh, spiritually and mentally. So we, Greg had talked about having some events that were online and some that were offline. And we found that to be a really meaningful thing uh, with our hybrid Camino, but we've also used it in different modules that we've done hybrid learning and hybrid experiences with. And the reason that we found that it works so well to have time away from your screen is that uh, it, it kind of takes some of that Zoom fatigue away. If everything is online and you're expecting someone to be online either in Zoom or doing online learning on their own away from the group and everything is in front of a screen, I think we can all attest that, that you get really burnt out really fast. So having that mix of things that they can go do offline, whether it's um, a craft or, or a baking, uh, experience or maybe writing a letter to a friend or different things that you can incorporate that still fit within your theme parameters, it, it will give a bit of that fatigue a chance to dissipate. And another reason we have found out is that when you're giving people the freedom to come up with their own discoveries and to find inspiration in different prayer practices, different, different spiritual activities away from the screen, but you're not feeding it all to them. You're kind of giving them the freedom to create their own experiences. It really allows God to move personally within the participant's heart. That way it's not the experience is the exact same for every single person. It's going to be different for each person and it's going to hold different meaning for each person. And along those same lines of letting, letting people kind of giving them a few examples of what to do offline, but then giving them more freedom for how to find those offline experiences as well. You're really taking that time to teach those lifelong faith skills of how to have everyday God moments and not have someone give it to you directly, which I think in this time where we are apart more is, is really a kind of a gift that we're given is that we're bringing faith formation into the home and it's not just in the church building or not just together as a group. We're really giving people these lifelong skills of how to build their faith formation in their everyday lives, which in turn, all of those things really makes it a true experience and not just a course that they're taking or not just another Zoom they signed up to do. It's really a faith experience, something that will stay with them and that they can care them past just that time online and offline. We would love to hear from you and to hear your experiences of hybrid formation, your questions. And so what we'd like to do is take some time now to each kind of share one by one. Uh, we often on these uh, roundtables love to invite people by mutual invitation, which comes from Eric Law and the Kaleidoscope Institute. And the idea is that each person shares something as they were invited and then invites another person to, uh, to share. There's always the option if you would like to pass to pass and then we can come back around and ask again at the end. Uh, but it's, I think, a nice way to not be anxious about who will be next, but just to feel the gift of the invitation from another person. So we've offered uh, some guidelines here that come from that model. And that is we listen ref reflectively as people share and receive their gifts. Uh, and listen, that there might be ways that we want to see what the connections might be that we want to explore more at another time or later on. Uh, there's a spirit we hope to cultivate among us of being open to new ideas and to have sort of a sacred curiosity and always to be mindful of time. So we have about 40 minutes, which means that's probably three or four minutes per person. So you can kind of gauge how big of a paragraph it is, right? Um, what I would encourage us to do is consider these questions for reflection. And what I'm going to invite us to do is to look over the questions. The first one, what hybrid experiences have you offered or participated in? The second is, is there a hybrid experience you're considering for this fall? A third one is, what is inspiring you in this time? Another one is, what are you wondering about? And what we wanted to do is just offer you the opportunity to respond to one of these questions at the start and say as much of that within that framework, a couple of minutes that, that you could. And then as we're able, we'll come back around and see if there are other things to share 
as well. And as we prepare to share, I'm gonna invite Lauren, if you would be willing to be the first. Thank you, Greg. Um, so we have offered some experiences that are somewhat hybrid, I would say, that for the most part, what we have done has been mostly on Zoom. Um, but we've had the most success with a hybrid model with our youth. Um, they were gathering, they've started gathering every other week in person and then every other week online, whereas initially they were online every week and having some space for them to be able to gather in small groups in person has been just a joyful thing. They've been so glad to see each other um, and to do some socially distanced games and have a devotional. So that's worked really well. And then the online piece of it has been games and discussion um, and devotional, sometimes prayer, music. Um, but I'll admit this is something that we've, we've been really challenged with, wondering about what what a hybrid would look like um, for us because the Zoom burnout has been real for our community. Um, this fall, we're looking at offering Sacred Ground in a couple of weeks, which is the Episcopal Church's dialogue program about race in America. Um, and I have a lot of questions around how to, how to do this effectively um, because it really was initially intended to gather people in person for long periods of time. Some of the dialogue sessions are three hours long. Um, so we're cutting some corners. <laughs> um, and I do wonder about how to build trust effectively with this vital conversation about white supremacy and racism and how do we respond as people of faith um, with courage um, when we're not able to be face to face with one another and when big emotions come up. Um, and that the, the question of emotions coming up and how we navigate those together is something that we faced with the small group program that we offered over the course of the summer as well. How do we hold space for one another when we can't, we can't reach out and, and acknowledge the person with a gentle touch? We can't um, always read body language well. So those are some of the challenges um, for sure. Um, I'm really inspired to hear about the hybrid Camino. I have spoken with a colleague of mine, Alina, um, who participated and she was just so delighted to have the chance to be a part of that experience and to walk. Um, so I am wondering a lot about, about our bodies and how do we keep our bodies connected with one another and moving um, and attentive to the movement of spirit. I would like to invite Zoe to share. Thank you. Um, so I will start with um, what's inspiring me, first of all. Um, my community is pretty small, especially in terms of children and youth. And sometimes um, while that creates opportunities, it also creates some challenges, especially in um, uh, a less uh, physical format. <clears throat> but what inspires me, <clears throat> what is inspiring me is the opportunity to hear other people's experiments and experiences. Um, it makes um, taking some risks seem less risky, um, less scary to try certain things out, even if they don't work, um, because I have um, some insight from others who tried different things. And so that's really inspiring and helpful. Um, and then the other question I'll ask, answer, um, so uh, the idea of a hybrid experience for the fall and something I wanna work on <clears throat> my own focus has um, mostly been younger children um, and uh, for whom the electronic format is even more challenging. Um, and so trying to connect them both with worship, we have a live streaming worship at St. Andrews to connect them with that in some way, but also um, make sure that they have an activity that can be, um, that's a meaningful one that's coordinated with worship. Um, the form of our, um, of, of the education we do is godly play. So it's Montessori based and it's very much focused on um, manipulables and activity, um, but it also um, expresses the value that children have the capacity for concentration. 
Um, and so trying to figure out ways to provide the children with some materials that can connect them in some ways to the online worship, but also then to expand family resources for, for family worship that's not connected to technology. So that's me. Thank you. And um, I, um, because I haven't seen her for a long time and she's underneath me on my own screen, am going to invite Carol Herger to speak next. Thank you, Zoe. I, I'm Carol Herger and I'm at St. Lawrence's, which is a very small parish. We just got a new interim priest, so we're in flux. And um, so I, I'm in a bit of a struggle right now in knowing what kids are going to be participating. Uh, someone on Vestry has, has gotten um, three children that seem to be interested in doing a Zoom once a month Sunday school. Um, I'm not prepared to go into church because I've got several risk factors for COVID. Um, well, the hybrid experiences that I've participated in, um, I did a workshop through a connection on knowing godly play in a new way on Facebook. And so that was a real interesting experience to do it through Facebook because there were live um, presentations that you could participate in. And if you couldn't be there, you could do it either synchronously or asynchronously. Um, and because it was in England, I was asynchronous every time. <laughs> but then each of the people in the course would make a, um, a recording to post on Facebook and then everybody would share. So it was very engaging and really delightful to see what they were doing on the other side of the pond using godly play in new and very different ways. So it was, um, and I'm taking some of what they have done and hopefully can incorporate it in my once a month things where I do want to mail home some particular materials to go with the particular lesson. Um, and there was some great inspiration there. So right now I was, before I got on the call, I was looking up where I could buy beads so we could make a circle of the church year and the different color beads because I thought, well, I'd love that. And I could just send them a pack of beads and they could each do the beads themselves. And, <laughs> um, and it, you know, so we're tied in and give them something concrete. And I think it's really important if I'm going to ask them to be on the computer that there's some outreach that, you know, they get something in the mail that, and there's a concrete experience to it. So. I will um, call on Liv Spica. Yeah, Siptak. Hi, thank you. Hi, I'm Liv Siptak, and I am a vestry member and other various things at St. John's in Breckenridge. Um, we are in this interesting situation of being in COVID lockdown and having our church being re renovated. So we have actually literally no building. I mean, the building is still there, the shell of it. But there's a foundation being poured and all kinds of interesting things. So even if we could go and be in the building, we can't. <laughs> so um, we are thinking, of, we, we are having to think about kind of like level two, levels two and three about how do we do this in terms of worship and formation. And we literally haven't done anything with respect to formation. And um, that's why I was really curious to join this conversation today because we have we have such a rich formation experience typically when we're in person and that the idea that we're not doing anything um, seems just not us and and I think there are a lot of us who are feeling that gap and so um, in terms of anything that we have we have done no nothing hybrid or otherwise <laughs> but I think but we uh, despite that we do have a rich um, offering in terms of worship experiences and um, evening prayer every day and that sort of thing but I think that this this entire conversation is super inspiring the idea that we could invite people to do some joint 
online and on their own or even in small group um, small group gathering sorts of things to to have like some discussion that's meaningful and then to do some individual experience on our own um, so yeah this is just kind of opening up a whole bunch of a whole set of ideas we don't have really the um, we don't have so many children so I'm really mostly thinking about this from an adult perspective particularly we're, tip, we're hev whoa, heavily <laughs> hold on a second there's a, one of the things that can go wrong on zoom um, we uh, have a heavy retirement community too who are here uh, either year-round or part year-round but now we have everyone because we're doing this virtually so we have quite a bit of I think hunger for this sort of thing so I am keen to brainstorm now after having gotten some of these ideas from all of you. Uh, so I, because I can't stop staring at the waves, I'm going to call on Todd, please, to share. <laughs> so compelling. Thank you. That's where I hope to be in a few weeks, permanently. Ah, lovely. I am retired, moving to Costa Rica. Um, what kind of inspires me is um, the hearing all of you starting to think outside the box some and come up with creative ways to engage your people. Um, I've been giving a lot of thought to this. Um, formation is my passion, has been my, my entire ministry. And I, I'm invite you to, to think about something else too as you go forward with this, and that is how you can empower your people to do their own formation experiences at home in a sustainable way by creating the structures. You know, I was thinking of the Jewish community and their Seder meals around the home and what a simple way to spend, to set some time aside to, to invite God's presence and think about God and pray and all. And their holiest of days is celebrated not in the synagogue, but around the dinner table with Passover. Uh, but find really simple structural ways, like with a couple of you with the kids and your hands on with the God we play like Zoe and Carol, um, a simple model is, for example, is um, have the family take turns setting the dinner table and whoever's sitting it that night, part of their job is to come up with some object that's a symbol for them of God in some way, put it on the table and at dinner the family talks about it and maybe that person goes last and everybody else shares their ideas first. S simple ways to invite that into the, the practices um, and create rituals around the family too and in basically, uh, not providing programs so much as the resources and structure for people to be able to do this on their own, whether it be individuals creating their own personal, um, you know, many of you, I'm sure, have, have created your own structural lives of, of faith and prayer and meditation and all of that. But uh, if your experience was anything like mine, you know, you ask people to teach Sunday school, what do you hear? Oh, not me. I, I don't know anything. I can't do that. So how do you empower people to say, yeah, you can do this on your own. You can create these opportunities at home where you're doing your own thing. And then have groups maybe to, uh, to check in with each other. Triads are good because, you know, how hard it is to get a bunch of people together in person, much less online. But if you have only three, it may be easier to, to accomplish that. And, and things like that. And, yeah, you know, that's kind of the, the thinking I've been having lately is to even go beyond uh, providing input is providing the structures where they can start simple and create their own uh, family rituals for meals for some Saturdays you know like I don't know about you I grew up uh, saying grace before meals right this little formula right or the prayers at night um, with my oldest son I decided not to do a formula prayer and so as he started to learn to speak I was doing thank you God prayers and every day you know, I'd start off saying, thank you, God, and just whatever was through the day for this and that. And as he learned to speak, he would start joining in. And I still remember one of those days when he learned a new word. And so when it was thank you, God time, he said, thank you, God, for shoes. But he participated in that. And his faith life is, by the way, very vibrant today. Uh, I'll conclude with this. I don't want to take too much time. I don't know if you've uh, heard of the Fuller uh, Youth uh, Research Project that they did on what differences in a family, in a, in a child's life, 
help them have a faith that sticks with them into adulthood. And they found that it wasn't programming and great youth groups and all these powerful resources that most of the small churches don't have. It was really their experience of adults of faith. And so there's a book called Sticky Faith that I recommend to people um, to, to create those avenues and those, those structures and the, the role of the parent in all of this and how important it is to empower the parents to become faith nurturers in the home, something they don't normally tend to do. So, okay, uh, thus says the word of Todd. I'll pass it on to another retired priest, Craig. Okay. Um, thanks, Todd. Good to see you. Uh, Todd and I had something in common. I'm like a lot of older clergy, kind of digitally challenged, but we both experienced uh, some programs at Virginia. I think, Todd, you were there one year that I was there on digital faith formation. And that was kind of the beginning uh, for me. But as I was moving towards retirement, didn't do a lot. So um, what I've been engaged in is sort of three different experiences. One, I was actually uh, involved in preparing an online uh, course at ILIF um, using the Canvas platform. And um, the, the class was not, didn't happen because there weren't enough people to sign up for it. But I created a kind of preliminary synopsis, did all sort of the groundwork to launch that class. So that was kind of my first introduction to Canvas. Um, and so the next thing that kind of happened to me in the last year is I was invited by a, a man who experienced a two session class I did at St. John's Cathedral. Um, and he is uh, kind of a contemplative bent. And he invited me to join a group of five people, which he called a wisdom circle, which is essentially a, a small group of people who are interested in contemplative spirituality. And so we meet, we're meeting twice a month. Now it's every week to discuss a book. Right now we're reading Richard Rohr's um, Naked Now. And there's a structure to the, to the sessions which the leader started, created, but it's actually, it's now shared leadership. But we have a structure and very clear goals and understandings and boundaries. And that, that has been uh, really, really helpful for me, particularly during this COVID time. I think part of it is just the grace of the group of people. We're all very diverse. Um, I'm, there's one other ordained person as a UCC woman, another Presbyterian deacon, a retired anesthesiologist, and then a leader who is a, but they all have a strong contemplative bent and the conversations are incredibly rich. Um, so that's one thing I could come back to. The third thing is uh, I've, I've signed up to do a online uh, class at the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, Richard Rohr's program. And this is a, a course with uh, James Finley and Mirabai Starr on Teresa of Avila. And I've always had an interest in contemplative spirituality. So I thought this would be a good experience. I, I wanted sort of experience to see how Canvas was being used. It's, 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 um, you know, there isn't a whole lot of interaction because it's all, um, there's no grade, there's no accountability per se. And so, but I, I do enjoy the, the teaching sessions that James Finley has been doing. I mean, they're very wonderful. Um, but to come back to what inspires me, and then I'll conclude, um, you know, I, I, I really, my teaching style has always been more interactive and I'm, I'm a, a, a good facilitator um, I, I can do lecture, I can do PowerPoint stuff, but um, what I enjoy is facil facilitating group discussion. And um, so what I, what I am inspired is that the opportunities for doing small group um, discussion around with some structure with sounds similar to what you were doing with the Camino program uh, with a focus and also with a spiritual practice. So, um, I think the spiritual practice component, as you've, you've noted, is really important. And uh, so um, I have a lot of practice with centering prayer. So that has been my spiritual practice. But I know that the Camino 
the structure of the Camino and walking is really is uh, really is really great. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at. Um, let's see who to go to next to see the screen again here. Uh, well, we do Anna, who was had I still been a good shepherd, would have been a neighbor. <laughs> right. I, have not, I have not met you, Anna, but welcome to the diocese. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, basically, um, <clears throat> I'm relatively new at St. Martin's. And due to all the uh, leadership flux there, had a lot of things hit me the minute I walked through the door. Um, uh, <laughs> I was joking and say, the other day and saying, you know, it's only been four months and I already could use a vacation. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, they're wonderful people, just a lot of work. So um, we have not offered any um, uh, hybrid offerings. Um, and so I'm very inspired by what I'm hearing here today. Um, I'm realizing uh, that this this that particular modality of a hybrid offering you know can definitely um uh create a, a much richer experience um you know i've been doing some things with the adults that's my area is adult formation um children and youth formation is lagging and small and is on my you know i sort of have an internal worry list that I carry around in my head. And that's um, one of the things. Um, so I'm definitely going to um, recommend to, and it's all volunteer, de definitely gonna recommend to the volunteers that they listen to this and maybe we can you know, watch this, the recording of this meeting and maybe we can brainstorm together on what we can do because um, what we're doing right now is only partly successful um, and not at all successful with the younger children and families. Um, anyway, so kind of that's, um, you know, that's where it's at. Um, I, I've been sketching out actually as, as we've been talking, um, a hybrid experience I'd like to provide in the near future on prayer experiences, because of course that would lend itself very well. You know, people have their own experiences and that gives us something to talk about, <laughs> both collectively and privately. I happen to be, a, fortunately, I'm a trained spiritual director, so, um, and I've been in practice for about 20 something years. So uh, I could meet with people if they're having particular difficulties. So that's it. Um, that's, you know, that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, did everyone, was everyone invited? I think you were, but I just want to be sure we didn't miss anyone. I'm scrolling back and forth through great. Thank you so much, all of you, for your sharing. Uh, what a rich group of people we have here with so many experiences. Uh, we really do believe in this idea of um, hybrid is a great way to uh, overcome the, uh, the feeling that we're always at the screen all the time. And uh, it's great to do things away from the screens. Uh, Elizabeth, are you going to talk about this part? Which part? The offerings away from the screen? Uh-huh. You'll have to, I'll have to apologize. That was okay. me um, just touching my mouse and it was going backwards through the presentation. Okay. Uh, um, I, do we want to say just a little more? I, I think that it'd be kind of interesting. I don't know how you feel about it as a group, but if we could say a little more about the hybrid Camino and some of our learnings. Uh, several things we learned from that experience seemed like they touched on things you all raised. And so I thought it might be nice if we spent a couple of minutes here near, near the end just to give you a little more feeling of what we learned from that and what, what that took on. Um, a combination of the different modes, right? Uh, and Tracy, I, I always like to give you a little credit because I think yours was the inspiration that began the hybrid Camino uh, journey we began this summer. You had an impulse of we could do something hybrid that would apply to in invite people into an experience 
And I wonder if you might just say a couple of words about how you had the kernel, and then you offered that to Elizabeth and I, and we both said, yes, absolutely. And it sort of took, took on a life of its own very quickly. Um, yeah, I think, um, and I mentioned this earlier, that I just had a real sense that people needed something uh, to look forward to. And we had a long stretch of summer ahead of us without summer camps and vacations and, and the things that typically frame and give meaning to our summer. And so I wanted to see if we could offer an experience. Um, and, I, and I think the word process probably was for, foremost in my mind, a, a way to process uh, what people were going through. Um, and I think it did that in the end. But the interesting thing that we discovered is that I don't think in the course, we had 50 people on the Camino, and in the whole course of the Camino, we never heard the word COVID. People were so caught up in the experience of walking and getting ready, and they were excited by the discoveries that we were offering them, um, that when we came together, we just, we were joy-filled and excited to see each other and share um, whatever we'd uncovered uh, during that week. Um, and surprisingly, because I walked the Camino about a, well, almost exactly a year ago, mm -hmm. and it was just a life-changing, amazing experience. And uh, my husband and I both did this one as well. And, you know, we were wondering, could it be any, in any way similar uh, to what we had, had experienced um, in Spain? And what we found is that we were so intentional um, in walking and in doing the different experiences that we actually went a lot deeper than we did in Spain. Um, where we were caught up to a certain extent in the um, just the, the joy of being overseas. And so it's kind of a Camino vacation that you're on. Um, <laughs> sorry, Greg. Um, and that's not to slight the, <laughs> the Camino, which I would do again in a heartbeat. Um, but we went, we went really deep um, and, it, and it was wonderful. So I'm kind of rambling on here. Um, mm -hmm but would love to hear what Elizabeth and Greg might add to that. I think that's great. Thank you, Tracy. Elizabeth, would you share something about what we've been doing with some of the activities and things that we invited in the hybrid that gave people that away from screen time? Of course. And then, Liv, I see your comment in the comments, and I will address that as well. Um, but we, we did inspired moments and additional discoveries. So some of the additional discoveries were things that were online, but then we had these other ones that were offline and it was things like we provided the recipe for Spanish tortilla. And so people got to make that in their homes and have a treat that they would have had if they were on the Camino in Spain. And um, we just had a bunch of different, you know, trying Spanish drinks and there was there was a bunch of different fun, fun little activities that really helped people to step away from the screen and really just kind of find these moments in their everyday lives that they could bring the Camino experience into or um, or find little faith moments in everyday life, kind of as like Todd was talking about, making it a practice and not something that we were specifically saying, you must do this, you must do this. None of the inspired moments or, or uh, activities were mandatory. It was all choose whatever is speaking to your heart and whatever is gonna help you go that next deeper spot. And so with the hybrid Camino, with the credential, it was all stamps that you would get at if you were walking in Spain. And so um, we left one section of that blank for people to create their own stamps. Yes, Greg has it on hand, perfect. Um, we left a blank for people to create their own stamps for moments that were inspiring to them as they were walking. Um, I remember Greg telling us a story about how one day he saw like a million bunnies just kind of all over scattered throughout his walk. And so that was kind of the thing that was inspiring and stuck out to him that day. And what could that be telling him to see all these bunnies in the city? And um, so people were able to create, create their own inspired moments. And it really gave a new way of 
you know, he could have walked by those bunnies and thought, huh, there's another one. But instead it became an inspired moment that he really took time to notice. Mm -hmm. So um, giving people those, those kind of opportunities as well. And, and Liv, you're asking if there is a Canvas account available for parishes or if you'd have to have your own. So we have a Canvas account um, for the Episcopal Church in Colorado. And if you were looking to do some kind of Canvas course, some kind of hybrid activity with, with your church, and you just got these little ideas kind of floating around in your brain that you want to explore further, we'd be happy to, to work with you to figure out what that might look like, how we can create a course together for that, and how we can help you train some facilitators so that it is something that really is owned by you, though we would be inviting people into it through on our end. And then some of those courses that were mentioned or those engagement opportunities that were mentioned at the beginning, are those available on Canvas? So, I mean, are they, is there content, I guess, that's already available if we were to access that account? So the Discover, Embrace, Become is on Canvas. Okay, perfect. Quest is a different module, different platform that we will be using with that. And um, the book, Coming Beloved Community is also a different platform that's going to be more asynchronous. People would be doing that all totally on their own time. Got you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's a mixture of all, and we would be okay. more than happy if anyone is wanting to explore any of these modules a bit deeper, um, any of these modes of hybrid learning, we would be more than happy to spend another round table or a different Zoom really going more in depth with those with okay. you. Thank you so much throw out there too that in October we're launching a hybrid version of Eucharistic Visitor training um, that people can do uh, at their own pace throughout the month of October um, with two sessions um, that are in person at the beginning and the end, one to onboard and then at the end one to do a Q&A and go through possible scenarios, things like that. Greg, can I make a comment? Um, I think, um, you know, what I heard Liz kind of saying there um, is I think that there are a couple of key components um, that could be applied across the board. One is um, experience. The, the Camino experience is a pilgrimage experience, right? And as soon as you say the word pilgrimage, I mean, it opens up all kinds of doors because there are all different kinds of pilgrimages. Uh, there have been books written on pilgrimage. Um, but the other thing is that I know you to you and Greg, and I don't know, Liz, did you go on the Camino, the one a year ago? Who else went on the Camino? I mean, uh, the, but I know you two went. So yeah. the point is you had that experience in the background, yeah, which I think, again, so it, it, gives some, it gives some context. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I think is what Liz was talking about is, uh, Elizabeth was talking about is, um, so you've got some structure. You've got context, but then within that, you have choices. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the riches of this, because because the big picture context is is pilgrimage, right? Mm -hmm. Then you zoom down a little bit. Okay, this is the Camino pilgrimage, and then you zoom down a little bit more, and so we have people who went on that pilgrimage, so they they have that experience, which lends context, which I think is not essential, but but what draws me to to small groups around contemplative spirituality is that they are experiential. Mm -hmm. But it's what you do with the experience. And I think Liz talking about the, the relationship between that structure, right, of the pilgrimage, then with the choice, the choices available, the creative possibilities to do within that. That's that wonderful tension. And that's, that's what I think is gold. It's hard to do. But I think that's, I've heard a lot of that today. Absolutely. And Craig, what I would say, it, it, we, I think something we learned, we said it was a lot to do this summer, but it was also not as hard to do as we thought. I love uh, Tracy's reminding of our just-in-time formation because we were, realized we don't, didn't have to have it all laid out for months in advance, but that we could be attentive and responsive to what the groups were needing as we went along. One other piece that we brought in that was really powerful in this case was reaching out to people around us to share their experiences, their uh, expertise, uh, their inspiration. And so sometimes things we had were quite inspiring and very deep. Uh, we invited Michelle Danson, one of our priests in the diocese, to offer a video reflection on Teresa of Avila. And we 
embedded that in a Canvas discussion around a visit to Avila in preparation to walk the Camino, which we do with people when we go to Spain. But people loved that virtual visit to Avila and the time with Michelle. Uh, so that would be, I'd say, the deeper end of the pool. At the other end, we reached out to the Bishop of Spain and said, could you do something for us that would, uh, I think I said to him, the phrase I kept using was, can we do things that surprise and delight people? Because especially now in this time of COVID, how often are we feeling surprised in a delightful way? Well, he created about a 10 minute video for us making paella in his kitchen and giving <laughs> us the recipe to make paella. Yeah. What was interesting later is Michelle uh, wrote me a note and said, I feel as though I've shared in the Eucharist after watching his video. And so you might think about who are the circle of people, not just right in your congregation with you, but further out that might have gifts. That What we notice is every person we asked if they'd like to participate, the overwhelming response was, absolutely, I'd be thrilled to. And so that just enlivened it. They became, in a way, in this theme, they became uh, Camino pilgrims we met along the way. Uh, and so was really a great gift. Uh, but I encourage you as you're thinking hybrid to think who else might offer a little surprising gift in this? It doesn't have to be all on you. We also found having a leadership team was great. So it was the three of us, but then we had among us six small group leaders so that we had two small group leaders in each small group. And it started to spread out the leadership and uh, energize the involvement of the leadership team. So there's some ways to do it so that it doesn't feel a burden of being on one person. Liv, I, and I think that group size is important. I mean, Tracy was talking about the intimacy that happens in a group and nobody knows what the magic number, but let's just say not less than four and not more than eight. You know, I mean, you know, th there's also part of that too Absolutely. that really adds that richness, right? Absolutely. You know, the bigger, the wider context, but then you're, you're letting people, the conversations can get quite, quite deep in a smaller group that they couldn't in a larger group. Absolutely. Um, what I would encourage you to do is look at this week's uh, Diocesan Digest for information on several of the offerings that we're talking about. Uh, one after another, they're in there, and they will be in the weeks to come as they're coming up. Uh, but if you have questions about particular offerings, and I see your question about Beloved Community, uh, that's going to be a, the dates. It's going to be available to you whenever you want to use it. It's, an, it's a recorded offering. So it's available when you would like to use it. It'll be awesome in that way. And then Liv, I just wanted to make that clear that we have the Canvas account and you absolutely have access to use it. So yes, at no cost. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say about the hybrid community, I think that was meaningful for our people. Uh, and that is that we did ask a registration fee of $50. And we said, from this, we're going to give half this registration fee as a contribution to the uh, project of the Spanish Episcopal Church building an Anglican center in Santiago. And so we had a giving towards a real need. Uh, and we learned from that experience, one of the board members from the Anglican Center project was also one of our Camino pilgrims. And she shared about that project and talked about uh, how fragile and uh, poor the Episcopal Church in Spain is. And I think that gave a meaningful way both to make meaning at home, but also to support something important uh, that was in terms of mission and outreach. Uh, and so you might think in those terms as well, that people are not only investing in themselves, but they're doing something good for someone else at the same time in their formation offering. And I'm looking at the clock, it's one o'clock, exactly. How did we do that? It's great to be with you all. I believe we're going to talk about next month, if you choose to join us, we're going to talk about virtual gathering spaces, which is another mode of gathering people. Uh, but it's been great to be with you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.